as Finlay said, Sir Robert Seppings was essentially the naval architect uh, for the Royal Navy at the time that Unicorn uh, was built and launched. But more importantly, in the context of what I'm going to talk about, he was uh, an innovator. He introduced a number of innovations into the way in which uh, ships of the time were constructed uh, and the way they were operated. And that's really what I want to, to look at. So what we're going to talk about is Sir Robert Sepping's life. In order to do that, we need to go back to the beginning. Uh, he was born in... Uh, 1767 in Fakenham in North Norfolk. His father was a cattle salesman and married to uh, somebody called uh, Linda. They were not a very well-off family. And in fact, uh, Robert had to help by acting as a postman, taking uh, mail from Fakenham to Wells-on-Sea, and he had his own mule for that purpose. So he doesn't come from a wealthy background. He has no actual background in the Navy at all. But when um, in 1780, his mother's elder brother, uh, who was a retired naval captain who was ta taken at residence in Plymouth, he adopted two of his, uh, of his siblings, his sister and uh, uh, John Milligan Seppings, his brother. So we're getting, and then Robert himself was taken on by John Milligan uh, after his father died in 1781, who seemed to take in a whole tribe of, uh, of the family, and uh, including uh, Charlotte, who became Robert's wife. So this main, meant he moved to Plymouth, which at the time was one of the three main royal dockyards, along with Portsmouth and Chatham, responsible for building ships for the Royal Navy. And there we see an image of uh, Plymouth Dockyard, as it was about the time. You can see the dry docks in which the ships were um, maintained, and we've got the port itself here. And it's these dry docks which are become important in um, Sepping's tale. He came under the uh, mentorship of John Henslow, who was the assistant surveyor at Plymouth Dockyard, and who, again, played an important role in Sepping's life. And that's just a plan view of the dockyard. You can see, again, the, the dry docks and the various other docks around the port uh, that were, uh, were used for both construction and maintenance. Once he was there, he took a post at the dockyard as an apprentice shipwright under John Henslow. And as it says here, this quote, the care with which he was taught by and the kindness he re received from Mr. Henslow would help bring out in Robert those qualities which would contribute to his success in the future. He was educated at the hands of Mr. Henslow in dock ships and Plymouth Yard, but he, there's a probability he'd be given some schooling at Fakenham. And later in his life, Seppings was quite touchy about the... Uh, the schooling he received and the criticism he seems to get for his lack of it. So he had a no formal scientific education, but he was interested, he was enthusiastic. And by 1800, he'd become a master shipwright assistant at Plymouth, which is quite a, a senior position in the hierarchy at the time. And that leads to his first innovation, what are known as Sepping's Blocks. Uh, one of his major tasks was the shoring up and lifting of ships in dry dock so they could be examined and repaired. And the image shows the Duke of Wellington uh, in dry dock from about uh, around 1850. But the ships were taken into the dock, water removed, so he could work on the, um, the hull. The problem was that this is a very simplistic diagram. But once you've got it in the dock, it's held up by props and it sits on wooden blocks at the keel. So if you want to work on the keel, you've somehow got to raise the ship. Now, the only way they had to do that was to use the tide, which meant flooding the dock, letting the ship float, altering the props, letting the water out again, and hopefully you've got it suspended off the, off the blocks so you could work under the keel. If you wanted to uh, protect it, you would have to uh, then add additional blocks. So Seppings noted that the procedures for doing this were very time consuming and inefficient and started to work out how he could prove that. So he 
experimented with a whole series of models, uh, and they became known as the Seppings Blocks. And using these, 20 men could achieve what had previously required 500 men in about uh, two thirds of the time. Uh, and you could dock and undock uh, in a single spring tide, which you couldn't have achieved previously. Trials of the blocks were conducted in 1800 using the San Joseph, a Spanish first rate captured by Nelson at the Battle of uh, Cape St. Vincent. Uh, 1797 in what was known as Nelson's Patent Bridge for boarding first rates. But, and the following year, they ordered a dock, the Admiralty ordered a dock at Plymouth to be equipped with the blocks, and in 1804, awarded Seppings the then not insignificant sum of a thousand pounds in recognition of his work in developing the blocks. So how do these work? Well, that's a diagram of the blocks taken from Sepping's own paper, but uh, modified hopefully for clarity. At the top, you've got the lower hull of the ship and supports. And here we've got the blocks, which basically consist, as we can see here, of two wedges and an angle block sitting on an iron plate. And uh, we have this uh, ram, which has a significant role to play. So basically, what you can do is you drive the wedges in, that lifts the block up, uh, and that will give then support to the keel. So you could position these blocks before the water was, uh, uh, before the ship was let in, let in the water let out, and the ship would then sit on top of the block uh, here. If you then wanted to remove uh, part of the support to work on the keel, you didn't have to refloat the ship. All you did, there were the blocks as they would be installed. All you needed was your battering ram, and you come and knock the um, knock the block uh, the, the, the wedges away. The block would fall, and you have access to the keel. If then you wanted to put that back, you simply drove the wedges in again using the battering ram, and you could remove the block at another part of the keel. So it made it much, much easier to access the keel. You didn't have to reprop. You didn't have to flood. You simply uh, use the the ram and the blocks themselves to uh, get to access the system the, the the keel. So that was his first invention, and in 1804 he received the gold medal of the the then Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce, now the Royal Society for Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce. And as it says here, they awarded him the gold medal and. Uh, attached an engraving of this invention along with models and drawings were placed in the repository of the society. And it, Sepping himself accompanied this with a note, uh, setting out a lay before the society a drawing and a model with a paper of the system invented uh, by me for the obviating the necessity of lifting ships uh, and, it, and so on. So he is now receiving acknowledgement and credit for his work. It described the blocks and their usage. This paper is downloadable online, and it's where I got the, the drawing of the, uh, of the blocks from. It was noted that the account was accompanied with certificates. Again, we now see Sir John Henslow, who has now become surveyor of the Navy, and the master shipwright at Portsmouth, the foreman at Sheerness, to confirm his achievement. And then in 1805, it was published in the Philosophical Magazine, uh, Sepping himself provided a description, and again, the drawings are, are there. It's interesting to note that in that 1805 publication of the Philosophical Magazine, other articles were written by people like Sir Humphrey Davy, who uh, we all know about, David Mochette of Steel, Thomas Jefferson from the United States, Alexander von Humboldt, the explorer, and uh, Jean-Baptiste Bayot of magnetic fame, and also, uh, as an aside, the uh, uh, the discoverer of cream of tartar. So he had a contribution to cooking as well as to science. So it shows that he's now engaging with the scientific community of the day. And just to look at this, is not terribly clear, but just to, these are some of his contemporaries. We've got Thomas Telford there, we've got Ada Lovelace, we've got the Brunels, Mark and Isambard, we've got Congreve, Trevithick, Maudsley. So he was aware and in the same community now that these people were operating. So he would have had access to them. He would have talked to them. 
he would have uh, communicated with them. And that's important in understanding what Seppings did and how he was able to do it. So he's not operating in isolation. He's operating within a community. And that community is responsible for the developments of the Industrial Revolution. So, so Seppings then in 1804 moved to Chatham, which is another of the Royal Dockyards where he became the master shipwright. And down here we have an image of, uh, of Seppings. Uh, Chatham Dockyard, again, as I said, was one of the major Royal Dockyards. And here we see a, a, an image of it. But at the time he moved, warship design was facing a number of significant challenges. The availability of suitable timber, and particularly that used to produce what were known as the compass timber. There was a great shortage of timber for ships, ship construction, and this was significantly limiting the ability of the Royal Navy to function. Also, timber as a structural material is limited. The biggest ships you can build in, in timber are about four and a half to 5,000 ton. So you, uh, we're getting to the physical limit that timber as a material in terms of its factors such as Young's modulus uh, that you can build. So if you want to build bigger ships, you've got to take some action. You needed to increase the longitudinal stiffness of the hull to reduce the effects of hogging. And the historian Nipper and Longridge comment that all one ships were victims of hogging they began to hog as soon as they took to the water. And in fact, it's a tribute to Sepping's design that Unicorn itself doesn't hog as much as it might otherwise have been doing so. And that's primarily because of the actions and the design changes that Sepping's introduced. And if you want the hull to be longer, bigger ships, you need to strengthen it, not just to take account of the wood, but to take account of uh, the fact that, for example, torsional stiffness needs to be increased to reduce the working, which opened the seams on the ship. So he was faced by a number of challenges. And finally, you need to increase the offensive and defensive capabilities of the ships. So looking at some of these, the Royal Navy asked its captains to report on the ship on their ships. So after each voyage, they would write a report. And in 1796, the first and second captain of the victory reported that I observed that the ship is very weak abaft. The transoms between the lower and middle decks work exceedingly. They also noted that the gun, the gunnels, top size, stern frame and standards work very much. This is the torsion. And that the ship has dropped so much abaft that the tiller traverses entirely on the helm transom, a hogging effect. So he also has this record from the captains of what is happening to their ships. Such that when in 1813, he was appointed with Joseph Tucker as the Joint Surveyor of the Navy, they were the, became the chief naval architects, and he was in a position to do something about this. He was also elected a member of the Royal Society in 1814, so his involvement in the scientific community has continued to develop. Which brings us to three areas that I want to talk about in Sepping's design, diagonals, knees, and sterns. We'll start with diagonals and hogging. And it led him to suggest that the, tim that the frame timbers could be braced using diagonal trusses. Now, this isn't new. The, for example, Joshua Humphreys designing the American big frigates that fought in the War of 1812, which again, Seppings would have known about and he'd actually been able to see uh, the president, but in fact, the president didn't, wasn't fully completed with diagonal riders. But so Humphreys used diagonal riders in his frigates, as we see in that diagram. What Seppings, however, was proposing was use wrought iron. The Admiralty had tested wrought iron made by Henry Court against the best quality Urson's iron uh, in a series of dockyard trials at the, at the end of the, uh, of the 18th century. And wrought iron of consistent quality uh, was now becoming available with rolling mills used to form it. So he had access to much better quality, consistent quality wrought iron, which is what he was proposed to do. He proposed his method before he became the uh, chief surveyor at a meeting of 1811 confirmed by Sir John Barrow, the second secretary of the Admiralty Board, a very powerful man. And the changes were opposed by older shipwrights without sense or science. However, he received support from Barrow, 
and persuaded Charles York, then the first Lord of the Admiralty, to instruct that his method should be adopted by the Royal Dockyards. And in 1815, HMS Howe became the first ship to be laid down and built using his diagonal principle. And he set out his approach in a paper published in the Transaction of the Royal Society in 1814. And he refers to a 74 gun ship being 170 feet or more. And the fact that the, the planking of that length, however thick or in whatever way it is joined to put together, must under the present system bend with its own weight. So the fastenings, the connection must suffer from a want of stiffness and a change of form is the consequence. So he recognizes the problem. And in this paper, he referenced the use of a, a gate. And he said, there's a simple farm gate. And we all know that if we take that simple farm gate and we push it, it distorts. But if you put a simple diagonal on, it gives it rigidity and stops it distorting. And he went on to discuss, and these are just copies of the drawings from his paper, uh, a classic truss there and a truss built using diagonals. That latter truss is known as a Warren truss, and we still find it in use today. That's a footbridge across a motorway, and it also found interesting uses in other ways. There's a, a biplane using essentially a Warren truss uh, of Sepping's uh, design to uh, support its, its wings. So he's taking this approach, and this is where his first you get the first hints that he's not entirely happy with the criticism he feels he's getting for... Uh, his lack of scientific education. Because in a later paper in 1817, and this is the one for which he was awarded the Copley Medal by the Royal Society, he, he addresses the suggestion that he derived as elsewhere, and he refers purely to this bridge at Sch famous bridge at Schaffhausen, designed by Gubernman, as his being his only inspiration. So he's gone away from the farm gate, um, maybe he thinks this is a more sophisticated explanation. Maybe he thinks it'll indicate he, that he is actually a member of the formal science community. I don't know. But certainly from this point on, he seems to get increasingly irritated by people commenting on his lack of formal scientific education. This bridge was actually burnt down by uh, the French in, uh, in, in 1797. So... Uh, it is no longer in existence. But he does get, he, he, from this point on, he gets increasingly touchy. And this is how it would appear. That the, the above drawing is a, a drawing of unicorn, and the bottom is just a sketch showing the, the layout of the, of the trusses. The second element is knees. These were defined uh, as a crooked piece of timber having two branches or arms used to connect the beams of a ship with a side or timber. And they contribute to the strength and solidity and enable great firmness to resist the effects of a turbulent sea. But they relied upon these things, what were known as the customs uh, timbers. And these were cut from trees which had been pollarded and grown to create these various timbers. And as we've seen, these trees were becoming scarcer and scarcer. So what we do is we take advantage of SEPIC and others take advantage of wrought iron. And this is a drawing uh, taken from a, a naval architect's book of the period, and it shows some of the early designs by Seppings and uh, Mr. Roberts, who is a, an interesting protagonist uh, to whom we have no time to, to go into, but he's an interesting character. Uh, he was at Pembroke Dockyard. And we've got bifurcated knees. I've redrawn them to help clarify. We've got bifurcated knees. We've got what are known as plate knees. Uh, we have braced knees, we have T-shaped braced knees, and the one which isn't here, which is the angled knee, which sit under the, under the deck beams. And you'll see particularly the bifurcated and the angled knee if you go on to, on to Unicorn. And this is just a drawing of Unicorn. Uh, this is originally taken from uh, some work done uh, by Roderick Stewart a few years ago, and I've modified it in the context. This is how it would have looked traditionally, and this is one of Unicorn's sides with the bifurcated uh, knee. And again, if you go on board, you'll see these. And the third element I want to talk about is sterns. And he was aware that you needed to remedy the structural weakness at the stern to improve both defensive and offensive capability. 
And the stern of these were the most vulnerable, vulnerable to enemy gunfire and limited in the offensive capability. We can, this, as you say, the vulnerability was brutally demonstrated at Trafalgar when HMS Victory crossed the stern of the Bossantere and the opening broadside of the Victory fired along the open deck of the Bossantere is reported to have killed over a hundred of the Bossantere's crew and perhaps dismant dismantled about 50% of the cannon. In the second of these respect to the offensive capability, when the Endymion was pursuing the president, it took up a position on the stern quarter of the president, and the president was not able to bring any guns to bear on the Endymion, whereas the Endymion was able to fire on the president. And that was because of the different design of the sterns. So you've got two, uh, 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 Seppings also noted other occasions. This is the, the Alexander was chased and captured by five French ships of the line. She put up a gallant resistance, but she was not able to fire her stern guns, and when the enemy laid on the quarter, she ceased to annoy her opponents, i.e. she couldn't fire at them. And he goes on to note that the two principal defects in the defence of water by the guns appear to be the difficulty and the incapability of using some of the guns and defence on the quarter. And the interesting one comment here, that if you try to position it in certain that the explosion took place too far within board. We'll see what that means in a, a, a moment. So basically, the conventional square stern left gaps in the coverage, particularly on the quarter, whereas the round stern enabled those gaps to be uh, covered. And we have two examples from sister ships. This is the Trincomalee, which has the classic square stern, and the Unicorn, which has the rounded stern. And this is one of Sepping's own drawing, and it shows the uh, round stern and this is what he meant by an explosion uh, in board. The shape of the deck and the shape of the deck meant that for certain angles, the muzzle of the gun wouldn't protrude through the gun port. So you actually had to fire. So the discharge from the muzzle took place in board of all the gases. And hopefully the ball went out through the, uh, the gun port. Hopefully. If you were lucky, it didn't. Unlucky, it didn't. But that's what he means by the explosion taking too far in board. And this is just uh, taken off the unicorn. It's not very clear, but this shows Sepping's own drawings for the stern form of the of the unicorn. But he was also looking to the future, and he and he was to, and uh, this gentleman George Harvey noted in the 1822 a conversation with uh, Seppings, where he notes that in the event of future wars, an alteration of the form of the stern would be necessary, as the guns. Uh, uh, as consequence of the introduction of steam vessels, and that America is firmly convinced. Of. And this is what he's talking about. This is the Demologos, uh, designed by Robert Fulton, which entered service with the US Navy in 1814. Seppings goes on to say that he was told by good authority that the Americans have uh, lately manned one of the frigates and directed experiment to try if a vessel propelled by steam could not come up under any circumstances, lay on the quarter of the ship they attacked, and the result was completely in favour of the steam vessel. And then he goes on to say the failure was the inability to defend her quarter due to the, 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 the square form of the stern. So he's actually thinking, thinking ahead in terms of his, uh, his designs. Not everyone agreed with him, and these are just some of the objections, some of which are, a ship not, look, looks not ship-shape. The situation of the water closets is not well disposed, particularly in the wardroom, so the officers' water closets are not as freely available as they perhaps were. The captain's cabin has deprived of some space. That a British ship requires no defence abaft. And that a ship is not so powerful abaft with a circular as with a square stern. I think that's in sailing terms. So not everybody was happy with this, but a lot of these um, are aesthetics. They're not about the what Seppings was actually looking at. And this is again part of this tendency that Seppings is increasingly have to become sensitive regarding criticism of his work and that he had no formal scientific mathematics. But as I've noted there, neither did George Stevenson. So, And this is an aside, I looked, when I was reading this, I looked at it from um, an engineering design perspective, rather than a naval architect or military or other perspective. 
And if you look at it that way, this is the scientific method, classic diagram of the scientific method. You start off with an observed effect, and through research and hypotheses, you generate a, a, a test hypotheses. And it's aimed at generation of new knowledge. Engineering deny, <coughs> design follows a similar path. You identify a problem and establish need. But your difference there is it's problem solving. Yes, you generate new knowledge in the process, but it's problem solving. And that's what Seppings was about. He was a problem solver. And again, just looking at the information that he has, these are some of the uh, developments in manufacturing technology, John Wilkinson, Henry Moore's screw cutting lathe, uh, Trevithick, uh, the block bill with uh, um, Brunel and Maudsley, uh, hot blast method of iron production. That, so again, he's aware of this happening in the community, but he's also aware of steamships. This is just a timeline of steamship development. So by the time Seppings becomes the surveyor of the Navy, steamships are quite a common thing. And in fact, the Marjorie, uh, which sailed across the uh, uh, across the channel in, uh, in, eight, in 1815, two years after he became the surveyor of the Royal Navy. So again, the point of showing this is that he was aware of what was happening. So if we look at it from uh, Sepping's point of view, he has a very large store of implicit or tacit, tacit knowledge gained by doing, watching and experience. But he also has access to explicit knowledge through his links to the to the scientific community. Sorry, that's my watch talking to me, if you heard it. Uh, so what's, what, what's, what Seppings is doing is synthesizing. He's taking information from a large number of sources, he's synthesizing it and driving towards a solution. So while he's not using formal mathematical analysis, in fact, uh, some of the basic equations were developed by Euler the previous century, but you couldn't actually solve them until the end of the 20th century, uh, or at least solve them manually. But in terms of looking at what Seppings was doing, we have two examples. We have the unicorn and we have the trincomalee. And these are just some comparisons. So you've got the wrought iron knees, some diagonals, bifurcated knees, the straps in the hold and the bracing at the stern. Whereas the trincomalee uses bracings, you've got plain size, it uses wrought iron straps, but not, uh, uh, not knees. It has no uh, diagonals in the hold and it's wrought, it has some limited wrought iron bracing at the stern. So we're fortunate, and we have this, these two ships, which are semi-sisters for comparison. Anyway, Seppings was knighted in 1819 and, uh, and granted a, a coat of arms. And he retired, perhaps not uh, of his own volition, in 1832. And he was replaced by Sir William Simmons. And this led to questions in the house and articles were written about the appointment of, of, of Simmons and his dismissal. And as it says here, subjects of an animated discussion in the House of Commons. And Seppings received a lot of support. And it, uh, his uh, pamphlet of great ability, read with more temp, the spelling is theirs, not mine, uh, uh, and a sound argument and satisfactory proof. Uh, but others differed. And this is one of the more caustic ones which were advocated, uh, advocating Captain Simmons. They advocate the cause of Simmons and the injury accrued to the country by the inefficiency of Sir Robert Seppings. Every new ship launched by Captain Simmons adds to his reputation, while the errors of Sir Robert Seppings are becoming glaringly apparent. He never built one good ship, and only one approximate to merit, who was the caster. Not only has Seppings never built a good ship, he has spoilt many which were good previous alterations. And this refers to Caledonia, who was taken into dock, the beam was increased by one foot, and she now... Uh, carries the gun, the gun deck ports lower. It continues, they assert that a person not able to make his own calculations is not fit for the situation of surveyor. Could Sir Robert Seppings make his own calculations when he was appointed? We remember him as a dockyard matey of good promise, never dreaming of rising to be Sir Robert Seppings. The next, the next one is, uh, I think, is particularly cutting. We say that this not to his disparagement, far from it, but his calculations were limited to his chalk and rule. We think, still think that Sir Robert Seppings would have, if controlled, have proved a very efficient master builder, and there he would have stopped. 
But the man who survived his ground climatic without trouble, he said, with a decimal or vulgar fractions, would find much more difficulty than Captain Simmons, who always had the powers of deep calculation. We doubt if Sir Robert ever made his calculations the last. All dogs don't, don't learn new tricks, and an infinite series of algebra is infinitely puzzling to a man who is past the age of 40. I don't know whether you, uh, I find that uh, both interesting and quite amusing, actually. But he, this is what I mean about people attacking Seppings for his lack of education, his lack of a scientific background. Anyway, Seppings died in Taunton on the 25th of April, and these are just some dates of his, of his life. I would stress I've really only touched the surface of Seppings' life here. He's a, there's a lot more um, about, uh, about him out there, and you can dig a lot of it out online. There's a lot of in interesting information out there uh, about his work, about the controversies, about his thinking, uh, and so on. But in half an hour, we can only scratch the surface. So this is just a, sum of, uh, a summary of his life, some of the ships that he worked on. Uh, we've got... Uh, <coughs> we've got... Um, uh, his f retirement, whether it's forced or not. And in 1840, he dies in Taunton. So in the half hour, in the half hour that we've got, that is Robert Seppings' a life. <laughs>